Welcome to NOAA Central Library's online platform for the presentation of research and ideas in support of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. Today's library seminar is titled Cross Comparison Study of AD Software and the Application of Population Dynamic Models. The presentation is part of the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar series, which is developed by NOAA Fisheries and organized by Kristen Blackheart from the Office of Science and Technology. Today's speaker, Andrea Havron, will be introduced by Kristen. But before I hand over the mic, here are just a few housekeeping items for our live audience members to improve your viewing experience. If you're having trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, I suggest that you log out and rejoin us. This resets the software and usually resolves most technical issues. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. I've added the channel's link to the chat box. Our speaker shared her slides, and, um, and, and so if you'd like, you can go to the handouts menu and download them during the presentation. We are very interested in your questions, and we encourage you to ask them throughout the seminar, even though the speaker will not address them until the end of her presentation. All audience members are muted, so type your questions or comments in the chat box under questions located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. So with that last detail, let's get started. The mic's yours, Kristen. Thank you, Lisa. Um, our speaker today is the um, newest member of the National Stock Assessment Program, and boy, has she hit the ground running. Um, the work that she'll be sharing with all of us today is the results of a, plat a software platform study that she has um, been working on in support of uh, FIMS development for people that are not familiar. FIMS is the Fisheries Integrated Modeling System that is um, under development to build a next generation software system um, in support of stock assessment. Um, so this was this project was in support of that to help us figure out what platform to build in. Um, and Andrea has just done a super job. Um, I don't wanna steal any of the glory, so I think I'll just hand it over to Andrea and let her take it away. Thanks, Kristen, for the introduction. Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna be uh, talking today about a cross-comparison study of automatic differentiation software and the application of population dynamic models. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, Kristen gave a really nice introduction of FIMS and it was the motivation behind this project. Um, essentially, FIMS is looking to develop a modular platform uh, to advance stock assessments and next generation stock assessment modeling. And essentially we need to choose a software platform for our modeling layer. And this is based on a number of factors, such as what is the underlying programming language of the modeling layer? What types of in inference can this platform, um, can it do ba both Bayesian and maximum likelihood or one or the other? And what is the sort of the community support for this platform? And what is the input output uh, interface for this platform look like? How usable is it? And so with all these questions in mind, I embarked on this study uh, wanting to set up a couple of models to run through a different uh, suites of platforms in order to think about both um, computational and statistical efficiencies. And it can be tempting to set up a really complex model to do some type of comparison work, but I thought it would be best to set up a couple of simpler models in order to really tease apart some of the uh, differences between these platforms. Um, so I set up first a uh, population dynamic model based on a nonlinear mathematical expression of uh, a logistic growth function. And so essentially we're fitting a state space model here where we have R is our uh, growth rate and K is the carrying capacity. And both the underlying state process and the observation process follow a log normal distributions. Uh, these nonlinear mathematical models can be very uh, challenging to optimize historically. And so there's been um, a lot of advancements with respect to software platforms to be able to optimize these types of models. Uh, secondly, I set up a spatial model 
as these models tend to become very computationally expensive with sample size. And I set this up as a set of Poisson distributed counts with a spatial correlation term omega. And this is set up following the idea of a Gaussian Markov random field, which really takes advantage of a key uh, statistical property of sparsity, which I'll touch on in a bit. The platforms that I was interested in looking at included ADMB, Julia, Stan, and TMB. I'm sure a lot of you are all familiar with ADMB and TMB, and some of you might know Stan quite well. Um, Julia is sort of a new player on the field, and it's been recently developed by MIT folks and has some really interesting um, properties that we wanted to take a look at and see how relevant it would be for the FIMS project. So all of these platforms, what they really have in common is the concept of automatic differentiation. And this is taking advantage of, of the derivative. And if we're thinking about statistical inference, essentially we want to come up with the best parameters uh, given the data and the model. And this tends to be where uh, the derivative over a likelihood surface is equal to zero. And there are a number of <clears throat> different ways to go about calculating the derivative, including symbolic or numerical differentiation. Um, but essentially it's automatic differentiation where we have the accurate derivatives that are calculated very efficiently. Uh, we can calculate them up to very higher orders of derivatives. Um, typically there are two modes of differentiation, either a forward mode or a reverse mode. So essentially with a um, automatic differentiation system, will have some function that we want to find the derivative for. And we can set up what's called a computational graph, or it's also been uh, known to be called a tape, where we have our input variables, x and y, and they follow through um, a graph where we calculate intermediate variables, where we multiply x and y together, we take the sign of y, and then we add these two together to come up with our output variable z. So in a forward pass, we essentially will input uh, values for x and y and make a forward pass through the computational graph, calculating the um, output variable z based on the input values. Um, at the same time, we get the derivatives for free. And essentially, we would set the first derivative of with the partial derivative of x equal to 1 and the partial derivative of y equal to 0 make a forward pass to get the uh, partial derivative of the output variable z with respect to x. And then we would make a second pass to calculate the uh, derivative of z with respect to y. And so essentially with a forward mode um, automatic differentiation system, you need to make a uh, the number of passes is equal to the number of parameters you have in your model. So this is a very efficient system when the number of input parameters is small compared to the number of output parameters. However, in statistical inference, our output parameter tends to be our objective function, our log likelihood. So we just have one output um, variable and we have quite a number and large number of input variables. So it's preferred to use reverse mode automatic differentiation where we essentially set the uh, we would do a forward pass calculating all the um, intermediate variables uh, given the input values. And then we would essentially do one reverse mode pass, uh, essentially calculating all the partial derivatives in one pass. The challenge to reverse mode automatic differentiation is that we have to save essentially all of our intermediate variables in the memory of the computer. And when we have a lot of them, when we have a very um, complex function, there can be a lot of intermediate variables and it's sort of a, there's a number of different algorithms and approaches to minimize the memory cost of a reverse mode automatic differentiation. And uh, two of the sort of known approaches to reverse mode is what's called a static and another is dynamic. Uh, I'll start with dynamic on the right here. That's what's implemented by ADMB and Stan. There's a couple of um, Julia auto diff back ends that implement dy a dynamic tape. And essentially this is a flexible approach to reverse mode. And there is overhead, however, because we have to retape or reconstruct the computational graph for every iteration of the model run. In contrast on the left here, we have what's called a static tape 
where the computational graph is only set up once. And uh, in doing so, uh, there's kind of pros and cons, the cons being that we can't handle any conditional statement or parameters in conditional statements. There are ways around that using atomic functions, um, but it allows us to take advantage of performance optimizations, such as sparsity detection and elimination of common sub-expressions. Uh, this is the method implemented by TMB, uh, a Python program platform, TensorFlow for machine learning, and a number of other Julia backend auto diff systems will implement static tape. So uh, thinking about all this, uh, I was also interested in thinking about a number of statistical structures to models that implement different levels of efficiencies. Uh, essentially, the aim of this study is to really think about hierarchical statistical models where there are hierarchical levels of variance. Uh, in a maximum likelihood estimation context, we can think of this as like random effects models or state space models where we have some latent or unobserved source of variation that we want to integrate out of the likelihood to give us a marginal likelihood. And the uh, other framework for fitting hierarchical models, of course, is a Bayesian approach where we are aiming to calculate that posterior distribution of our parameters given our data. In both situations, we need to perform some type of integration over our latent variables or those extra sources of variability in the model. And when we know this, uh, what's to the right of, of the likelihood symbol here is what's called our joint likelihood. And when we know our joint likelihood explicitly, we can use exact methods such as the newton rapsom algorithm in MLE and Fritz or we can take advantage of conjugate priors in the Bayesian context. Um, but more often than not, there is no closed form expression to this joint likelihood, and we need to rely on approximation methods. In the MLE context, this is thinking about our modified likelihoods, such as penalized quasi likelihoods, the Laplace approximation, or our Gauss Hermite quadrature. These three listed here under approximations. Uh, as, as we move down the list, we improve the uh, accuracy of the approximation. However, the gloss hermite quadrature is limited with respect to very low dimensional um, integrations. So we can only really implement this at low dimensional, small parameter or small random effect size models. Uh, once we kind of move up into complexity, we really only can be working with the Laplace approximation or modified likelihood. With respect to Bayesian, we more most frequently are implementing MCMC simulations to uh, calculate the approximation of this posterior likelihood, thinking about Metropolis Hastings or Gibbs Sampler, and also the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Another, um, so uh, in terms of thinking about statistical efficiencies, uh, one aspect that we can, one sort of trick that we can employ is taking advantage of this concept of sparsity. If we have a random effect uh, model or a uh, multivariate normal prior or some sort of um, source of variability that follows a multivariate normal distribution, uh, we can take advantage of the concept of conditional independence, where if we have two observations, A and C, we can treat them as independent conditional on observation B. And this means that we can fill in those covariance matrices, matrices with a lot of zeros, and this allows us to greatly speed up computations. Similar to the idea of conditional independence is that if we have a situation where our observations and random effects are in a maximum likelihood model, can be specified uh, as conditionally independent, we can set up the model as being what's called separable. Um, this is typically a tool used in uh, the Laplace approximation, or rather when we're calculating the marginal likelihood, where rather than taking a multivariate integration of the joint likelihood of Q dimensions, we can split it apart or separate it into Q products of univariate Laplace approximations. And this uh, trick can really also speed up computation time significantly. 
So with all of those kind of thoughts in mind, I also wanted to be considerate of uh, computational structure of, of the different platforms in my investigation. And in order to think about um, computational structure and how these different platforms are kind of similar or different, just wanted to introduce kind of the concept of compiled versus dynamically interpreted uh, software platforms. So in compiled software, and this is sort of our C, C++ uh, general family, we have a model which uh, is, you know, typically a, can run from, you know, five lines of code all the way up to thousand lines of code, which is considered to be our source code. And that's, um, you know, treated as a unit that gets compiled into machine code. That uh, compiled code is then executed by the CPU. And this is in contrast to what's considered a dynamically interpreted language, for example, R, which you have your model, but you don't compile it first. You just run each model, each line of code, line by line. And R will execute the code line by line, rather than compiling it all and running it all in the CPU in one go. So essentially, a line of code is parsed into an internal object in RAM and then evaluated by the CPU. The CPU then sends a signal back to the source code and waits for the next in set of instructions. The uh, third type of structure is what's called a just-in-time compiler. And this is sort of a uh, dynamically typed language in that it's run line by line. However, it's also compiled. So it's sort of a hybrid approach. And Julia uses this approach specifically where we set up a particular function and uh, we add uh, data input for say in line five, we have two integer values added, um, inserted into our function. The, the Julia program will parse this line of code into an intermediate file, which then gets compiled into bit code, which lives on the RAM. And then it's compiled into code executed by the CPU. Uh, essentially, if we run a second line of code with the same uh, data types, in this case, two integer values again, we do not need to compile the code. It, it is just immediately executed by the CPU. So this really speeds up computation if you're doing a lot of repetitive function calls using the same data types. However, if you call the function again with a new data type, the code will need to be recompiled, in this case, for floating point number 2.1. In this situation, uh, we're, we're holding all these different uh, compiled versions of the model in, in the RAM of the computer. So this approach can be um, can take up some memory on the computer and, and can add to um, computational efficiencies. Uh, so sort of the trade-off generally is that a dynamically interpreted language tends to be slow. However, it's user-friendly. It's, it's very easy to read. It's easy to debug. As you're running the code line by line, you can find which line in your model is throwing an error, as opposed to a compiled code, since you're compiling it all in one go and executing it on the CPU. If there's a certain line of code that's throwing an error in the model, it can be harder to track down. So typically, it requires a little bit more technical skills in programming and can be harder to read. However, these models run very fast. And so that's sort of why when we are needing to run really fast um, computations, we rely on compiled code. And then the third option, the just-in-time compiler, as I mentioned, uh, this, this has a really useful, we're running code line by line, so we can easily track down bugs. It's very readable. Um, however, it uses up a lot of memory as it's putting um, those uh, different um, compiled versions of your model, of uh, storing them on the RAM, it can quickly consume a lot of memory in your computer. So I wanted to uh, isolate each of these software platforms in this analysis and, and kind of tease apart how each of these uh, platforms will implement a model and how it's structured. Uh, so I wanted to think about, uh, given a software platform, what's sort of the underlying programming language? Is that programming language adding an additional um, compilation step into a compiled language? And what is the input output or the IO interface look like for the platform? So for ADMB, the uh, programming language, the language that you use to write an ADMB model is a native source code that is saved as a TPL file. 
And this file is compiled first into C++ before it's compiled into an executable. The IO interface for ADMB uh, is either the command prompt or there are some R libraries that allow you to uh, call and run ADMB models and explore model output. So in, in this situation, this is a good example of how there's sort of multiple languages involved in running this platform. We have our source code, our C++ code, and then some type of interface. Um, in contrast, Julia, it was sort of one of its um, highlights is that it's a one language platform. Everything is written in the Julia language. So we write our model in Julia, that's compiled uh, into Julia code, and we interact with this model. We call and run the model and explore output using Julia language as well. So it's sort of a, a program where, a platform where you just need to learn one language, and then you can do everything you need to do within the Julia platform. Uh, looking at Stan, this is a platform that has its uh, a native source code as well. It's written in a Stan language, which is compiled into C++. So similar to ADMB, there's, an, there's sort of two compilation steps, one where we compile the Stan language into C++, and the second where we compile the C++ into the executable file, which gets run by the CPU. We have a number of different interfaces that we can use to interact with Stan, including the command prompt, you can use R, Python, Julia, there are probably others that I haven't listed here. And finally, TMB, this uh, platform is written in C++. So there is only one compilation step. We take our C++ TMB model and compile it into a dynamic link library, which gets passed off to R. R is typically the interface language where we can call and run the TMB models and explore model output. So I also wanted to think about the different inference pathways uh, with respect to each software platform. Uh, what's the Bayesian inference pathway versus the maximum likelihood pathway? And so again, we have ADMB, which is first compiled into a C++ code, which is then compiled into an executable. The backend auto diff uh, library was developed for ADMB and it's used to calculate the computational graphs. Uh, we can either run this executable within the uh, ADMB has an internal quasi Newton minimizer and an MC, MC Metropolis Hastings routine. But we can also pass this off to Stan using this R library AD Nuts uh, developed by Cole Monahan. And that essentially is an R library that takes the uh, ADMB executable and passes it off to the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo routine in Stan. With uh, Julia, again, this is a one language platform. So everything is sort of set up as a modular a set of libraries that will essentially do all, all the tasks that you're looking to do. So there are a number of maximum likelihood libraries like Optum, Mixed Models or State Space. And there's a number of Bayesian libraries. The one that I looked at is the Turing Library, which performs an advanced Hamiltonian Monte Carlo routine. <clears throat> Julia also has a number of automatic differentiation backends that you can essentially swap out uh, so it makes it for a very portable system which is really interesting. Uh, Stan is, I've only sort of investigated Stan as a Bayesian only platform where we have our Stan model compiled into our C++ which is then compiled into our executable. Stan has an in-house AD library that's used to uh, essentially direct the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo routine towards the most efficient, uh, when, when the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and CMC routine is taking its steps to explore the likelihood surface, uh, Stan will use the gradients uh, from the, the AD library to inform the direction of the steps. And this allows for very efficient MCMC exploration of space. And finally, we have TMB, which is compiled into the dynamic, dynamic link library. The back end here that we're using for AD is C++ AD, CPP AD. 
uh, team B interacts with R, which creates an object of the function, the gradient, and the set of input parameters. And this object can be passed off to a number of different R minimizers, like Optum or NLM IMB, to explore um, MLE inference, or it can be passed off again to team, uh, a library set up to interact between R, uh, the TMB model and STAN. Again, this is developed by Cole Monahan. TMB STAN will pass off the objective function over to the HMC routine in STAN. And so given all this uh, structure in uh, computational and statistical efficiencies, I was interested in studying up, setting up a study design to look at uh, different aspects uh, and how these platforms perform given uh, different types of uh, statistical efficiencies or computational efficiencies of interest. And so, you know, first of all, I was interested in seeing uh, which models can be uh, implemented in both Bayesian and maximum likelihood estimate context. And this, this study had no intention of comparing Bayesian versus MLE methods. It was merely looking at the capabilities of the different software platforms. Uh, given a software platform, could I run both Bayesian and MLE models, or were there restrictions as to which ones could be run? Uh, given these uh, two types of inference, I was, I was most interested in knowing if the, the platform could handle nonlinear mathematical models, as this is what we're most interested in looking at in stock assessment modeling and population dynamics in general. And then also thinking about these statistical concepts of sparsity and separability. Separability, again, is sort of a unique uh, way of expressing the Laplace approximation to um, improve efficiencies of computation time. So given that, I took my logistic growth model. Again, this is the state space model where we're estimating a parameter R, which is the growth rate, and a parameter K, which is the carrying capacity. And we have a state U, which follows a log normal distribution, and that informs the observations Y, which also for, uh, follow a log normal distribution. I simulated data for a number of different sample sizes and fit the model under both maximum likelihood and, and Bayesian inference. With respect to maximum likelihood, I compared the TMB model to ADMB RE, which is the random effect version of ADMB. And I created an ADMB model both with and without separability. Um, TMB sort of automatically detects this, and so there's no additional way of, of teasing apart whether or not a model is expressed as separable or not with respect to the logistic uh, formulation. I then fit um, models with uh, maximum, or sorry, MCMC. And for these models, I took the best estimates from the TMB model and used those MLE estimates as input for the MCMC routine. I used 2000 warm up and 2000 sampling iterations and four chains. I looked at Julia using the Turing library um, and also using the reverse diff uh, automatic differentiation package. This is actually the only um, auto a, the only AD package that worked for fitting this type of model. Um, for TMB, I used the TMB STAN pathway where I took the uh, objective function and then passed it off to STAN via TMB STAN. And finally, I fit a model with STAN. For this spatial example, I first simulated data for 100 by 100 grid and then sampled data from this grid for different sample sizes. Uh, for all models, to, simply com to um, simplify computations, I fixed the spatial range, which is that distance at which two locations are essentially independent. I set that to value of 50, which is half the uh, distance of the extent. And I, set, I fixed the spatial variance uh, to 0 0.75. I fit this model with MLE with both TMB and ADMB random effects with separability, and I fit it uh, with MCMC uh, looking at a comparison between TMB with, via TMB STAN and STAN, again using MLE estimates as the input parameters and 2000 warm up and sampling iterations and four chains.
so now looking at results, uh, I, I do want to mention actually just to go back to this slide, I also did fit uh, some, let's see, with the logistic growth model, I did fit, oh yeah, I mentioned Julia with the Turing and inverse diff, but I was not able to construct a Julia model for the spatial um, example. So looking at cross comparison results, first, uh, this is looking at the A, D, and B model only, but looking at it as it was set up in the separable and non-separable context. So again, separability is where we define the uh, likelihood as being a uh, sort of based on Q dimensions of a random effects, it would be a, a Q, a univariate Laplace approximations as opposed to a single multivariate of Q-dimensional Laplace approximation. Uh, so being able to separate out the Laplace approximation into Q steps, uh, univariate steps greatly simplifies computation time. And we can see here that the uh, separable model generally uh, runs much faster than the non-separable model. And it actually got to the point of large sample sizes where the non-separable model started to hit um, memory walls, where the model would fail uh, because there wasn't enough memory to run the model. In general, um, parameter estimates for carrying capacity, uh, our intrinsic growth rate R, our um, the state variance sigma and the state variance, or this is the standard deviation of the state variance sigma and, and tau, observation variance tau. Uh, we can see that parameter estimates are generally uh, fairly comparable uh, to one another with um, occasionally uh, the non-separable model not performing quite as well as the separable model. Uh, looking at both the ADMB separable model and the TMB separable model, uh, again, parameter estimates are pretty on par between the two approaches, um, but we do notice that the TMB model is performing faster than ADMB with increased sample size. And uh, moving on to the Bayesian comparison of that logistic growth model. Again, we looked at STAN and TMB using TMB STAN. Uh, we uh, considered the MC, MC efficiency. And this is essentially uh, an effective sample size and divided by computational time. And it's, it's typically uh, the ESS is the number of effectively independent samples per second. And it's the preferred method of comparing um, Bayesian models, different Bayesian platforms. And we, what we're essentially seeing is that the higher the efficiency, the better the performance between the two approaches. And as we increase our number of samples for this logistic growth model, uh, we can see that uh, in at low uh, sample sizes, TMB is performing better than STAN. And this is simply because STAN has a bit more overhead than TMB. But once we get out to larger sample sizes, that cost of that overhead uh, decreases the effect of the overall cost of the model. And we can see that STAN is performing slightly better than TMB. And we can see that STAN is, is running faster. So it has higher efficiency and it's also running faster than the TMB model. But um, the two are fairly comparable but with Stan a, a slightly bit more efficient than TMB. So now um, looking at parameter estimates, again, we can see that these two approaches are uh, fairly comparable to each other as we're increasing our sample size. We're getting estimates of the parameters that uh, are closer to that true uh, value in the simulations, which is indicated by the blue line here. So really the only differences that we're seeing is uh, due to um, computational run times and efficiencies, not um, accuracy of methods. And again, uh, just kind of taking a step back here, because we're essentially taking the TMB model and passing it off to Stan, the only real difference between these two approaches is that the computational graph is constructed in Stan while the computational graph is uh, the TMB approach is the computational graph is constructed in TMB. So this is really highlighting the differences in the uh, reverse mode approaches between TMB and STAN. 
Then if we kind of just summarize all of the model run times for both our random effects models in TMB and ADMB, as well as our um, model run times in the Bayesian context, um, it's we can see that uh, essentially with uh, Julia, I think what I wanted to just show here is that um, while all of our model run times, you know, ADMB is getting a little bit uh, slower as we get increased sample size in the random effects context, um, essentially our Bayesian methods are running uh, slower than our random effects methods, which is what is expected. But what's really surprising here is Julia was uh, just incredibly slow and it wasn't a very efficient approach. Um, part of this is likely due to the uh, age of the auto diff platforms being used in Julia. Both TMB and Stan are working with 80 platforms that have been around for a while and a lot of people have made improvements to make them very algorithmically efficient. And um, Julie is kind of a, the new kid on the block and still probably could work out some aspects that's leading to slow model run times. Um, another issue to mention is, is again, as, as our, uh, the memory use in Julia is much higher than what's being um, used up in TMB and STAN, and that could also lead to slow, slowing down of computational times. And um, for the spatial comparison, um, we're, because we fixed a lot of the parameters, I'm, I'm just going to show the uh, essentially the differences in speed. And the main takeaway here, again, uh, not surprising, but our random effects approach is running faster than the evasion approach. Um, that's sort of the general nature of using the Laplace approximation yeah. over MCMC routines. Uh, but of interest is that the TMB approach is much faster than the STAN approach. And this is essentially because TMB and STAN, again, are using those two approaches to computational graphs, where STAN has the dynamic computational graph and TMB has that fixed computational graph. And, and the benefit to the TMB approach is that it allows the, the model to take advantage of the sparsity. So we have this sparse uh, spatial model that's set up in such a way that we have our covariance matrix of that spatial random effect filled with lots and lots of zeros. And TMB can detect those zeros and essentially minimize the amount of computations that are being implemented in the optimization routine, where Stan is not able to perform that extra step. And so that leads to a great performance speed up of the TMB approach compared to Stan. So um, moving away from the idea of performance and accuracy, I also wanted to think about and consider uh, what type of community support is available for all these different platforms. And we'll see this plot over here on the left is a essentially a plot of Stack Overflow trends. And, and this is looking at the percentage Stack Overflow questions for each month asked about a particular programming language. And, um, you know, we've got R that's increasing over time, C++ is decreasing over time. And again, C++ is sort of the underlying programming language of, of STAN, TMB, and ADMB. And, uh, but we, this really highlights the fact that Julia, again, is, is sort of the new kid on the block. It's, it's very new in its development cycle, um, but there has been some increase in interest uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, the other aspect that I, I took a look at was um, thinking about seminal papers in Google Scholar and looking at how many times those papers have been cited over time. So I looked at the Fourier, Fourier paper et al. introducing ADMB, um, the Carpenter et al. paper introducing Stan in 2017, and the Christensen et al. paper introducing TMB in 2016. Additionally, I looked at uh, two R packages, uh, Glim ADMB and Glim TMB, and both of these packages essentially implement mixed effects models where um, Glim ADMB uses, of course, ADMB as the back end, and Glim TMB uses TMB. So of, of interest is that while um, ADMB and TMB uh, have been, or ADMB and Glim ADMB have been relatively low over time, and, and TMB's citation trends have been increasing a little bit over the last uh, 
five years or so, but of note is that Stan seems to be the uh, highest cited uh, platform in the literature. But close behind that is the increase in, in citations of, of using GLIM TMB as a mixed effect model. And this is sort of like an interesting aspect that I wanted to touch upon that GLIM TMB seems to have a lot of uptake uh, among ecologists outside of fisheries. And so as the user base increases, the, the requirement of support for this platform um, also will increase. And finally, on the bottom right, I looked at the number of GitHub repositories for each of these platforms. Uh, C++ had the largest uh, community on GitHub, which isn't surprising. It's a very uh, well-developed language that's been around for some time now. Uh, R also has uh, quite an extensive 8 million GitHub repositories. Again, not a surprise. It's a very um, diverse uh, platform that's used essentially the go-to platform for statistical inference. Uh, with, uh, in terms of sort of specific platforms, um, A, D, and B, and T, and B are relatively uh, small number of repositories, uh, Stan and Julia, with Julia being sort of a, the mid-range of 32,000. So this sort of is a, an overview of um, community support for these different platforms. And um, I think the most interesting takeaway is that uh, C++ is um, sort of a really well-developed uh, programming language as opposed to Julia, which is sort of a new emerging language. And uh, the amount of support out for using C++ as the base programming language of a, any given software platform is sort of a nice bet to make because there's a lot of resources out there and a lot of people in the community who can assist with uh, C++ development. So in summary, I just wanted to talk about some of the highlights from the study with respect to performance and maximum likelihood inference. Overall, TMB performs slightly faster than ADMB. I did not evaluate Julia or Stan, of Julia because it lacked the functionality to perform nonlinear mathematical models and Stan as I considered it to be a Bayesian only platform. With respect to Bayesian inference, uh, looking at the logistic growth model, Stan slightly outperformed TMB in this context uh, and Julia was significantly slower. With respect to the spatial uh, model, TMB was uh, significantly faster than Stan and that was due to the sparsity detection that TMB was able to employ. Uh, thinking about accuracy, uh, overall, Julia, uh, I, I, don't, I didn't show these results in this slide, but overall, Julia had poor accuracy of the model with all the parameter estimates, but all the other approaches were very um, accurate um, compared to each other. And that accuracy increased with sample size. With respect to usability, uh, Julia was, I found to be fairly straightforward to use and debug, um, but it was very memory intensive. The input-output interface was less developed. Um, essentially, the libraries used to um, plot, make plots in Julia or save data in Julia are all sort of new and emerging and and there are issues with the IDEs, interfaces, and reading and packages that I found to be less attractive. Uh, it sort of suggested that it was a very much new in its development cycle. Uh, Julia is also known to be slow for um, generating visual plots. Uh, due to that, uh, it requires a lot of different data types, so code needs to be constantly recompiled and ends up taking up um, a lot of time for those compilation steps. Uh, the Stan language I found to be very user-friendly. It's very well documented. It's probably one of the best documented um, statistical platforms that I've used. And uh, I found that the community, there's a lot of great resources available for working through issues or finding resources on, on resolving bug issues. TMB in general is, is harder to debug than uh, say R or Julia, but it does have that user-friendly interface with R. There have been a number of developments from the TMB developers group 
to improve uh, debugging with TMB, and now there is an RStudio interface to um, improve the ability to find errors in TMB code. In general, I found ADMB to be the hardest to debug. Its uh, native source code has a steep learning curve, and uh, the separability aspect of ADMB is harder to specify than TMB. With respect to support, as I mentioned before, Stan has the largest uh, developer community um, compared to TMB and ADMB. Uh, there, essentially, Julia has a small but dedicated support group, and so I feel like with the Julia community, there's a lot of enthusiasm behind this language, and and if you have a question that you want to ask or want answered, there's a lot of people available to assist you. So overall, in summary. Um, you know, essentially, I have a cross comparison study of, of these four different platforms and wanted to be thinking about it in both the Bayesian and maximum likelihood contexts. And I wanted to consider um, aspects of nonlinearity in the models uh, the, and the improvements gained from introducing separability and sparsity. And overall, I found that uh, I Kind of placed the different platforms in this Venn diagram based on different aspects of, of how these models fared with Julia not really being uh, quite there yet for implementing any type of complex modeling framework. Uh, when running nonlinear models it could only be implemented in a Bayesian context and uh, it had poor accuracy suggesting there were issues or errors perhaps with the underlying automatic differentiation platform being used. Uh, so I would place Julia uh, at the cross between Bayesian and maximum likelihood estimates if you have simple ecological models um, or if you want to code up the model yourself in Julia that's always a possibility but in general uh, go-to platforms for Julia are really um, limited at this point in time. I considered Stan uh, again as a Bayesian only approach it's a really great approach for handling non-linear models but uh, where it kind of lags behind is when you're interested in uh, looking at models where there's a lot of sparsity, uh, such as spatial models or spatial temporal models. In that case, these models can get really slowed down by the lack of taking into account any sparsity in the algorithms. Um, AD and B is able to um, estimate in both the Bayesian and, and maximum likelihood context. It's a great tool for fitting nonlinear mathematical models. It does have separability characteristics, but um, they can be challenging uh, to use and require a level of expertise, um, a higher level of expertise and knowledge in order to do so correctly. Uh, whereas I place TMB sort of in the middle of all of these approaches as it can be fit in a Bayesian and maximum likelihood context and specifying sparsity and separability in TMB models is, is very straightforward and easy to do. So in conclusion, I'd just like to thank all the uh, people who've helped me along the way with this project, Christine Stowitz, Cole Monahan, Sam Ermey, uh, the FIMS implementation team, as well as the community of AD&B and TMB developers. Uh, I've included a lot of links here, um, pointing everyone to resources for these different platforms and included references for the platforms as well. So thanks so much. Thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate your presentation, Andrea. Audience, we have about 12 minutes for um, questions, so please type them in the questions chat box, and I will make sure to read them to Andrea. And also as a reminder, um, Andrea has shared her slides with us, so please feel free to download them uh, from the handouts menu in the control panel before we end our, um, our webinar today. So while you were, were presenting, Andrea, um, when you were on a, a new page, I think it was a community page, and someone said that uh, it said it would also be interesting to throw BRMS on this list, Berkner 2018, though maybe it's too new. It's a community support page. Great, thanks for that tip. Excellent. Yeah, I'm going to wait another minute or so, see if we get any questions. And while we're waiting again, oh, here we go. Uh, this question says, great talk, Andrea. 
Thanks. I'm interested to know more about auto diff versus non auto diff paralyzed optimizers for spatial stock assessment models. Do you have any impressions on how fast par parallelized optimizers might be and compare to auto diff? Yeah, that's a great question, and it, and it is an avenue that I didn't touch upon in this analysis, but that's uh, that's definitely a, an interesting question that I think should be on the horizon, as well as is thinking about parallelizability. I know that um, both ADMB and TMB have, uh, can be run in parallel, and um, so it, it's definitely a different, uh, interesting avenue, but it's one that I didn't look into. Great. Um, another question asked, thanks, Andrea. Is the comparison done only for population dynamics applications or for other applications? So currently, the uh, main population dynamic model that I fit in this study was the logistic growth model. I did show results from the spatial model, but the aim is to build that up into a spatial temporal model, so it does have some level of you know, sort of statistical dynamics going on uh, with the idea that this this comparison study is is thinking about population dynamics specifically, um, given that's of interest to, you know, stock assessment modeling, um, but also because they present really challenging models to optimize. They have nonlinearities, they have different complexities in covariance matrices um, that require sophisticated tools for optimization. Excellent, thank you for your response. Um, this next question asks, it says, it looks, excuse me, it looks like Stan and Julia have significant institutional support. What are the long-term plans for TMB support and maintenance? That's a great question. Uh, so TMB is based out of uh, DTU. Uh, and I think that there is hope to provide further support for TMB um, through different funding avenues. Um, I'm, I'm not one to speak about what those avenues may or may not be, um, but I think the most interesting aspect that I've seen over the last five years or so is that uh, TMB has really um, increased its uptake among ecologists in general, and so you see it sort of infiltrating beyond fisheries. And the hope is that the more people that use TMB, uh, the more people you're going to inspire to want to implement development or um, encourage people with those skills to improve upon TMB. And, and the other nice aspect about it is that given that it's open source, uh, we can easily access the code, see how it works. So anyone who's sort of going through a computational statistical program could potentially look at the code and think about how to improve upon it. Great. Um, next question, uh, first of a compliment. Thanks for a great talk. I've heard that Stan has an optimization mode. Is it not very useful? Um, by optimization mode, I'm assuming the person is asking about uh, maximum likelihood uh, context. Um, from my perspective, it, essentially, statistically, you could consider if you set all of your priors equal to one, that you're essentially running a model similar to a um, maximum likelihood or generalized linear mixed model. Um, but I, I sort of theoretically like to think about STAN as a Bayesian approach, but that's sort of more of my, my preference in, in how I, I think about these models. Excellent. Uh, next comment says, Andrea, does your work suggest that FIMS is leaning towards TMB as the software driving platform? In other words, should future fisheries modelers sign up for TMB courses? Yeah, so we, we are leaning towards using TMB as our uh, framework for next year for FIMS. Uh, that, that decision was actually made recently. Um, I, I'm sort of working up this uh, this presentation as a paper to sort of live beyond FIMS, but I think that is the general take-home message that uh, TMB can perform both um, Bayesian and maximum likelihood inference. It has a lot of really nice properties 
uh, that give it the statistical and computational efficiencies we need in stock assessment modeling. And uh, there's, there's definitely um, expertise among the FIMS developers for TMB, as well as uh, community support that, that we will need for, for moving forward with using TMB for FIMS. Thank you. Uh, next question. Can you go over again the difference between the separable and the non-separable models and roughly what you had to do to specify the separability for the different platforms? Yeah, for TMB, there's no extra step for specifying separability for a logistic growth model. If you're um, developing separability for more complex structures, such as a spatial temporal model, there is a separability function in TMB that is relatively straightforward to use. In ADMB, uh, separability is, is specified with a, a function that requires you to input each of the parameters, states, and observations uh, as a, a line. It, it sort of takes each line by line um, item and runs the calculations within a separable function. Uh, so it's it's a little it requires a little bit more expertise to uh, code it up correctly. Thank you. Uh, Next question says, very informative talk. Thank you. Has there been a decision yet on which language FIMS will be coded in? Yep, thanks for the question. So yeah, as I mentioned, uh, we are we did make the decision recently to move forward using TMB for FIMS. And uh, I, I do want to add actually though that uh, the idea is that FIMS is a modular platform and a lot of the uh, functions will live in C++ code, uh, so sort of standalone C++ code. And the idea is to develop modular, uh, a modular framework so that uh, the C++ functions can then be read into TMB. And this allows for a, setting yourself up so that in the future, if there's less support for TMB and more support for another um, platform that can interface with C++ code, it would be easier in the future to translate it to a new platform if needed. Um, this next part, the person says, I think what's driving TMB is the open source aspect more than the performance. What do you think? Uh, I personally think it's a bit of both. Um, I think there is the that open source aspect of TMB is really uh, a strength. Um, however, there are some really uh, well-written and optimized code that provide it with efficiencies of improved performance, uh, such as automatic sparsity detection or uh, the reliance on uh, CPPAD and uh, some other aspects of, of the platform that give it efficiencies that other platforms don't have. Well, it looks like that was our last question. Uh, thank you for answering so many um, questions today. If your question was not answered or if you uh, add it after I, uh, the presentation, uh, it will not be ignored. I will forward them to Andrea. Um, and thank you very much for your presentation today again and to Kristen for organizing the series National Stock Assessment. Um, audience, I encourage you to share the recording of this webinar with interested colleagues. I'll have it uploaded to the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel in just a few hours after we end this presentation. I'm glad you joined us, uh, and NOAA Central Library is very proud to present the work of the NOAA community and its partners, and we hope you'll join us again for the National Stock Assessment Science webinar in the new year, uh, which will be hosted on the first Thursday of the month at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.